Good morning, everybody. This is Fiona DiDomenico, Senior Vice President with the Castle Group. I wanted to welcome everybody and thank you for joining. Um, we appreciate you guys getting on today. I see lots of people still looks like we have more people signing in. I wanted to just take a minute and introduce Castle Group for those of you that don't know us. Um, we are a privately held um, company. We are based in Florida. We have over 1,700 teammates and 300 associations across the state of Florida and in Texas. And we specialize in communities with um, on-site management. So generally those would be maybe towers or an HOA where they would have a team on site. And it could be, um, you know, a small number of, of units or it could be, you know, 2,000 homes. It doesn't, doesn't matter. That is what we specialize in is any community with an on-site team. And we have lots of different departments um, that can help you through these COVID times. We're going to do a, a great presentation today. We're excited uh, that Jay has invited us and joined us today. So, Jay, I'm going to turn it over to you. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, Becker's Backyard Command Center uh, in the Panhandle office. Uh, I'm Jay Roberts. I'm the managing shareholder of the Panhandle office of Becker. Just a little introduction about Becker. Uh, we're a full service law firm that's uh, really, really approaches uh, community association needs and have done so since 1973. We have 14 offices around Florida as well as uh, DC lobbying office and New York and New Jersey offices to serve community associations up there. Uh, I've been with the firm since 2010. I'm a board certified specialist in condominium and plan development law. And, Basically, this is all I do. Six and a half days a week, this is all I do. And I'm super excited and proud to represent Becker. And thank you so much, Fiona, for having me here today. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm disappointed, Jay. Only six and a half days a week? Come on. What's, what's wrong with you? <laughs> well, the, the other half day is uh, cocktails on Friday afternoon. Let's be honest with go. the other half day. Is. There you go. You got to enjoy that beautiful deck you have there at <laughs> Becker Central. So. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to take a minute, gosh, for all the board members who are who are who have joined us. Um, for those of you that are already Castle clients, I just wanted to take a minute and say thank you so much for all the support that you have given our teams and to Castle. These are, as everyone has said, unprecedented times, um, and we appreciate the support. It has never been a uh, a job as a board member. Your pay has never been great, and oh my goodness, um, you know the last month has been right unbelievable. So thank you for all of the support, and for those of you that are not uh, current Castle clients, thank you for joining today. Um, those of you that are with self-managed um, communities or with another management company, we appreciate you being here, and um, we're happy to answer any questions. We've got quite a few questions already that have come in. So we're gonna kind of walk through um, some slides with Jay, and then we'll answer questions as well as we go. As Gianna mentioned in the beginning, we're gonna have a Q&A at the end as well. So um, how are your neighbors managing, right, in the panhandle with all of this crazy COVID stuff that's going on? So one of the major things to know um, is obviously management companies, they are an essential business. Um, and the associations do have some special powers in these times. And wow, it's been amazing how things have changed as we've gone through. You know, uh, I didn't even know, you know, anything about, you know, COVID 60 days ago, really, other than the little blurbs you heard on TV. And, and now we're fast becoming experts, aren't we, Jay? It's amazing. Oh, yeah. And um, learn something new every day. You do. And that's what I love about this industry. You really do learn something new every day. So I think our message to you um, today uh, on this webinar is, you know, we're, we're going into a new normal. Um, this is not something that's going to go away on May 1st, right? We're going to have to learn to adapt. We've been adapting. Um, there's different things that we've been doing. So for example, we got a lot of questions on meetings and elections. So yes, you can do virtual board meetings. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Communication is super important um, in these times. So things like you know weekly newsletters to your residents, um, sending them out e-blast so they know what's going on locally in the community. Every community is different. I always tell my boards that I could have two, you know, communities that theoretically are identical side by side on the beach. You know, two towers side by side, and maybe they're identical in the footprint and the amenities. But you know what? They're each a unique community. And so the communication that goes to each one has to be unique. 
Um, and that's where your uh, expert management comes in. We at CASEL have provided and prepared um, what we call a response plan, almost like a playbook for the whole COVID uh, scenarios. And we've walked through each scenario. What happens when we get a potential case in a tower or an HOA? What communication should we do? And I know these are some of the questions that will come up as Jay goes through his presentation. We are going to be in the very unique position of um, having a COVID season overlap with hurricane season. Who knew, right? So um, again, glass half full, guys. We're all going to learn. We're all in this together. So hang in there as board members. We'll get through it. And we'll continue to do these type of webinars so that we provide you some support. Um, I think I'm going to turn it over now to Jay. And he can kind of walk through some of these things from a legal standpoint. And we'll uh, pop in with some questions, Jay, as they come up. Right. Yeah. So I know that the, the banner headline here is we're, we're boards. What powers do we have? And, you know, the first slide we have up here for people to read, this is the Emergency Powers Act of the Condominium. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Emergency, Emergency Powers Section of the Condominium Act. A couple of things I want to point out here. One, obviously, this was not written for a pandemic. It was actually written by one of my partners, Joe Adams, after the 2004-2005 hurricane rash. And the thought process here was, look, we need to have boards to have uh, agility and flexibility to do the things that need to happen after things like a hurricane happens. So what do we need to know about this? And, and HOA, stay tuned. There's a version of this for you. It reads almost exactly the same. So when I'm talking here about condos, this is going to pretty much apply to you as well, HOAs. But here's what you need to know about this act. One, notice the very first sentence of the act, the, the statute. To the extent allowed by law and less specifically prohibited by the declaration articles or bylaws. Why is that important? That's important because you need to talk to your attorney about the applicability of these statutes. It is not a panacea for everything. Your documents could provide some kind of hurdle that we need to either work around or at least know there's a prohibition for some portion of these uh, emergency powers. So that's the one thing is don't just jump in and say this applies. Second thing is, great, we have some institutional cover. How do we have some institutional cover? We have this statute, and we have pushed the DBPR to issue a statement that says, in their opinion, and the Division of Condominium Timeshares Mobile Homes Cooperative's opinion, this statute and Chapter 720 306, or 316 do apply to all associations that are governed by it. So great, we have some institutional coverage. Now, what can you do with these statutes? We have some things highlighted here. One is, has to do with notice. You guys know generally you have to do 48 hours notice uh, posted in a conspicuous place on the property for your board meetings. Well, that's for most meetings. For this statute, it says, look, you got to post notice as practical as possible. So what does that mean? That doesn't mean no notice. That means that you need to post some kind of notice. But if it's a decision that needs to be made this afternoon, and you know you're going to have a board meeting at three o'clock, post it now. Don't worry about the 48 hours. Here's the other thing I'll say about this is if it's an issue that is not an emergency, if this is just your regular board meeting, you need to rely on the regular and posted notice procedure that you've always been doing. Don't rely on emergency powers for non-emergency things. I think this section B down here, one B is pretty important as well. And that is cancel and reschedule any association meeting. What does that mean? Well, you guys know up here in the Panhandle, we are not during our annual meeting season. But I know, Fiona, you guys down there and in other places in Florida, you're right in the middle of these membership meetings. And, of course, we don't want to pack people into uh, a, a membership meeting. This gives you the cover, so long as not prohibited by your other governing documents, to move that meeting to later on in the year when it's safer to have it if you want to. And Jim, so, we, do, we do have a question, sorry to interrupt you, from Laura. She says, we have an annual meeting coming up 
at the end of April, and we're wondering about sending the owners a call-in number. You want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so here's the fun part. There's no playbook to this. Uh, so obviously the statute was not written for dealing with virtual meetings. I mean, and maybe it will be going forward in the future. I would think that this should be a wake up for the what we've called the new normal going forward, and the legislature will do the same thing. Do I personally have a problem with either Zoom meetings for the membership meetings, Zoom meetings for the board meetings, or just conference calls? No, I do not. When you are doing your notice for this and you have your time, place, uh, date, when you have the place, you just put the link in for the Zoom meeting or for the Skype meeting, or if it's a conference call, just put that in there. I think that's perfectly fine. What we really the real gravitas of that question, though, is how does that count for attendance? Because, you know, the statute talks about being in attendance in person or by proxy. So I would say, look, people can call in, but that's not going to cover the we get a quorum attendance. So you're still going to need to work getting the proxies in to make sure that you have uh, a quorum uh, of the membership there. And remember, you don't need the original of the proxy. Sign, scanned, emailed to you, manager, perfectly fine. Someone signs the proxy, takes a picture of it with their phone, sends it to you, you have it on file, Great, I'm fine with any of those. We don't have to do snail mail or handing it in, but for the quorum purposes, calling, I'm not quite comfortable there yet with that. I think you need to have the proxies in for quorum. Okay, perfect. And I can tell you from uh, what we're seeing, you know, real time is we have had uh, some associations hold certainly their board meetings. That's becoming the, the new norm. So board meetings sure. are being held uh, via Zoom and conference call. My only guidance on the Zoom, if you're going to do the video, if it's something you haven't done in the community prior, um, what I'm suggesting is that you do a bit of a dry run. There's lots of great tutorials uh, online. Um, Castle has one that we can send out. So at the end, if you want to send a note to info at castlegroup.com, Gianna would be happy to forward uh, some of those tutorials out. Send those out to the membership beforehand. You know, maybe even do a dry run if it's going to be an annual meeting. There's things like that you can do. Um, we have a lot of our large scale associations where they have, you know, a, a whole lifestyle, you know, division um, and a lifestyle director. They're even doing, you know, mahjong online and all sorts of stuff. So it is becoming the new norm, but you don't want to just, you know, drop it on to your residents. You want to be able to educate them and get them comfortable with the process. Yeah, so let's talk about a little bit more of the emergency power section. You know, these are a couple highlights, and this isn't the whole thing, guys and girls. We we put this out there. Well, what do they say? Kittens and 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 cats. Now that the Tiger King is around, uh, we want you to go look up this statute. If you're a kind of person, go look up and print out 718.1265. If you're an HOA person, print out 720.316. They say similar stuff, but I want you to pay attention to this. Implement a disaster plan. This is for you boards. You need to be thinking through. How does all this work? Now, I know many of you have talked to me before about doing this after a hurricane. And as you can see from the language here, that's kind of what they were thinking of when we drafted this to begin with. But you need to think of this in terms of this particular disaster plan, uh, you know, at, at least until uh, April 30th, we know that the, the governor's executive order stays in place. It could be extended after that. Uh, so long as that executive order is in place, these powers are going to remain. So it is it is worth you looking at what does this mean for our community? Well, I think that part of the disaster plan, and I'm sure we'll have questions about this, is the highlighted language in D and F below. And that really is closing down parts of the property. The big thing around here are kind of two things, the beach and the pool. Uh, you know, it, it, people always ask me, Jay, should we shut down our pool? I, I know that was some of the questions that came in and I might as well just jump in front of it now. I'm a lawyer. I am not an epidemiologist. I do not know whether you should shut down your pool. I can give you the considerations. Uh, here are the considerations. One, 
uh, you know your constituency. Are you having a lot of people that are coming from areas, especially hotspot areas? You know, we have an executive order about people coming in from Louisiana. We have one about New York, New Jersey, Connecticut as well that says that those people need to be self-quarantined. Do we have a large influx from hotspot areas? That might be a determining factor for you. Uh, others are, you know, where are we on uh, on actual capacity there? Uh, it, is there only 20, 20 people in the condominium right now, or do we have 500 people in the condominium right now? That's something to think about. But here's what you want to hear from me, because I'm the lawyer. It's the liability side. What is our liability with relating to this? Well, I can tell you this, I think you have the right to close it down. So the liability of closing it down during this time period, I think is minimal. Now, what's the liability of keeping it open? That's the question. The problem that you have here is many insurance general liability policies can include a rider that excludes people alleging damage or injury caused by viral outbreaks. Guess what? insurance companies are going to glom onto that language. And if a year from now, two years from now, we have an influx of personal injury attorneys that are saying, Grandma Edna got her COVID-19 disease at XYZ condominium because you didn't shut down your pool. Do I think that they're gonna win that lawsuit? No, I do not. Because Grandma Edna also went to two Walmarts and three airports on the way to the pool. But that's not the problem. The problem is having to pay for the lawyer to deal with the lawsuit. And if the insurance company comes back and says, sorry, it's an exclusion. We told you in the policy, then you may be on your own with respect to uh, paying a lawyer to defend the lawsuit that you should absolutely win. So are we going to see that happen? I don't know. I'm not real good at predicting the future. If I was, I wouldn't be uh, wearing you know, a, a shirt and a jacket right now. I'd be on a beach somewhere else. Uh, but you know, we have to think about the liability. And when you think about liability, there's no way to avoid it. So generally you insure around it. And what I would say here is there's a good possibility that many of your insurance policies are going to exclude viral coverage and therefore they may not provide an attorney for you. And I do think from a board's perspective, you should think about that in the terms of liability. Yeah, Jay, it's a great point. And I can tell you again from, you know, boots on the ground, what we're seeing in our communities is the majority of the communities have closed all of their amenities and they remain closed. Um, I know we had a question from Janet regarding the community pool and allowing, you know, residents only and kids, you know, the kids are out of school. It's, it's heartbreaking, right? They see that beautiful pool there and they can't use it. But, um, and again, it also depends on your county, right? So we have people from all over uh, the state, mostly the panhandle, but it does go even locally by county restrictions. So some counties have said, shut your pools down if you're in a condo or HOA completely. Other counties have sort of left it up to the, to the boards to make that yeah, decision. Let me, let, me, yeah, let me make one other point about the beach, because I, I introed the beach and up here, the beach is a big thing. So uh, I want to talk about that. Uh, for a second. We have local ordinances that are going on right now that have closed the beach and there's talk about them reopening uh, the beach. Everything I said about the pool applies to the beach. Right now, the government's made the decision for you. In fact, for you uh, beachfront owners, there was a lawsuit filed in federal court in Walton County where certain owners of beachfront property uh, tried to challenge Walton County's ordinance on closing the private beaches. And the federal judge just struck it down, said basically, look, there are police powers for a reason. The government for a temporary amount of time can take these actions to protect the public uh, at large, as well as you who owned your property. So, you know, we don't really have a choice right now, although that may change in the next coming weeks or two with regard to the beach. You certainly have a choice with respect to the pool. Great. Um, we had a question. Um, so Laura, Randy, and uh, Janet, I think we covered your questions. Thank you for those regarding pool opening and amenities being opened or closed. We do have another question um, regarding, uh, let me see, I just lost it. Um, social distancing. So once mm -hmm. we do open the amenities, 
the concern is, gosh, Jay, you know, how is the association going to enforce social distancing? Yeah. And I, I think the answer is you, you can't from a practical standpoint. Uh, certainly, we recommend, you know, signage. I know that when we started to close pool decks, for example, uh, boards took it in, in phases. And so some of our boards took away or moved the, the chairs around the pool so that they were, you know, distanced six feet apart. And then uh, inevitably, you know, a family, to their credit, they're all in the same home. They, you know, they're like 10 of them in the home. They came and they pulled their chairs together and said, well, we're a family. So, you know, from a, from a castle standpoint, it's, it's impossible. You don't want to be out there, you know, trying to physically uh, move people. Uh, some associations have talked about let's, you know, let's not put any chairs on the pool deck and, you know, do it that way. Um, but I think all you can do is signage and, you know, ask people to be respectful. But what do you think, Jay, from a, from a legal standpoint? Yeah, well, I think that you're on the right track here. I mean, look, again, I try to think about what this looks like a year from now in a courtroom where somebody is claiming we did something wrong. And by we, I mean everybody you and I are talking to right now, community leaders. What did you not do? I mean, that's what the lawyer on the other side is going to try to prove. So what do we need to do? We need to put the signs up. We need to create the paper trail. That's what we call it in our business. You create the trail. Look, we separated the chairs. We took some away. We put the signage up. Here's another thing. Uh, increased cleaning of places like elevators and not only increasing the cleaning what do we need to do we need to document that we increased the cleaning right it's not good enough that you just did it we need to have your chart saying you know what we were doing disinfectant x amount of times a day now we have done it x plus right and we're keeping track of that to show that the boards and the management companies took reasonable measures to protect the people on the property i mean the reality is you can't protect against everything all you can do is take your reasonable measures to try to prevent the spread of this and what i'm saying is since you're doing that or as we say up here, since she was, since she was doing that, let's go ahead and document the fact that you're doing it so that I have something to work with in court a year or two now, uh, from now trying to protect you. Right. Okay, I think we can go to the next slide, Gianna, please. Yeah, so j just those, I, I wanna go back to, to this one second. Yeah, so the 720, you HOA people, I don't want you to feel left out. I want you to know that that 720 is taking care of you and that 72316 that is where you're going to find very similar language to that 718.1265 same kind of rules apply with respect to the board meetings with respect to the membership meetings with respect to closing down the amenities Jenna, can we see the next one right real quick? And again, uh, I think I started off with this. I wanna finish it with, with a statutory discussion about this. Notice where the language there in both of these statutes say, except an emergency. That means that you need to still be following the general rules for any general business, unless it has to deal with an emergency. Don't abuse the emergency power sections by trying to shoehorn in things that would be your natural course of business in the association. People will think you are doing cloak and dagger stuff. Even if you're not, it doesn't look good, and there's no reason to put you into that. So. 718.112.2C, 723.03.2C, those are your natural and normal board uh, notice posting provisions. Please use those still with respect to anything that's not an emergency. Okay, great. And just to add on to that, um, again, you know, in the field, what we're seeing to reiterate the boards are, you know, when this first started, everybody was sort of saying, okay, we're, we're canceling, you know, the board meeting for next week. Now what we're seeing is boards saying, okay, we got to get back to this new normal. And so we are going to schedule our board meetings. We're either doing it via a conference call or via Zoom meeting. And, uh, and that's going well. And we're, you know, we're posting it with the right notice, all of the regular things you would do in the past. So most associations, you know, if they've got uh, somewhere on property that they normally post, whether it's in the elevators or, you know, at the at the community center, they're doing those, you know, paper postings because our staff is still working. 
We are essential employees. So in most of our communities, the staff is still on site. The manager's office is closed for walk-in traffic, but the manager and the admin, everybody is still there. Uh, and we're asking all of the residents to just call ahead of time or shoot us an email and make an appointment. If you need to come in to get you know, a key fob or whatever it is, people are still moving in and moving out. Business is still having to run in our communities. And so the team is there and they're ready. Uh, but we are just making sure we're being safe about it. Uh, all of the um, all of the castle teammates are, have been provided masks. Uh, they're following the social distancing, and we're making sure that we're there to to service the residents. Um, one of the questions that came in, and I just want to remind the audience: if you have questions at the bottom of your screen, you should see the Q and A. You can just type a question in there, and we'll take those as they come. Um, but Jay, we have a question regarding um, what procedures do we follow if an owner or tenant contracts the virus and are they obligated to uh, notify the association? So if you want to just kind of chat on that a little bit and then I can give some uh, commentary at the end as to what we're seeing with the real cases that we have uh, dealt with. Yeah, so a uh, couple of issues there. There, let me start off with the law. Uh, there is no ordinance in my area that would be uh, essentially a Scambia County to uh, St. George Island, uh, where there is a mandatory reporting that must be done uh, to the association. Now, I have seen uh, places like Ball Harbor down in uh, Southeast Florida, where such an executive order from their local government has come down. We do not have that here yet. So then the question becomes, well, let's say someone does self-report. Let's say someone does tell you, management company, look, uh, I, I, I have COVID-19, uh, I plan to self-quarantine, but I live on the 22nd floor uh, and I plan to be there. Uh, and that's all there is to it. Uh, what should you do? You know, there's great debate about this. You know, one, I'll tell you just my personal opinion. I think that, uh, that the manager and the board should get together and discuss. I think that a message should go out to the community that someone uh, in the community has been tested positive to give the alert that people should be extra cautious. What do I not think you should do? I do not think you should list the person's name, the person's unit number, anything like that. Uh, it's it's a little iffy as to where, uh, you know, disclosure laws like HIPAA come into play here. Generally, an association would not be bound by something like HIPAA, but you also have right in the acts themselves uh, a, a, a portion in the, the, the official record section that says medical information disclosed to the association is not subject to review by the ownership. So, you know, it would be a concern of mine if one of my clients wanted to say, you know, Miss Jones in Unit 202 has COVID-19 and she, she disclosed it to us. To have that disclosed could be considered a violation of the applicable act, whether it be the HOA Act or the Condominium Act. So I don't even think you need to get into HIPAA or, or any of that. So what, what, am I, what are we really saying? Give reasonable notice that it's a thing that you need to be paying attention to people, and especially now more in our community. In fact, if you get two reports, I would add an S. You know, multiple owners have have tested positive. To me, heighten the awareness without disclosing the person. Do you agree with that, Fiona? Yeah, I do, 100%. And I can tell you we've had, um, you know, obviously being across the state, we've had, you know, multiple, multiple cases in, in different communities from, you know, large scale 2000 uh, door, you know, HOAs to, um, you know, towers. And um, in our playbook, so I, I spoke a little bit about the Castle COVID playbook that we uh, put together. Um, we have sample letters in there. Uh, so when you get a potential case, and there's a big difference between a potential case and a confirmed case. Um, and, and what we define uh, currently as a potential case, it's not that, you know, Sally Sue was at the deli counter and bumped into Mary and, and she said that she talked to Tom and, and you know, George has COVID. <laughs> sure. That is not a potential case. <laughs> 
uh, a potential case would be, um, you know, a reputable, reliable source. So either a family member or the person themselves has contacted the manager or a board of directors and has said, look, you know, I haven't been feeling well. I've, I've been uh, in contact with a medical professional and they have sent me for a test or they have told me, um, you know, that they think I have COVID and they're going to test me. That would be considered a potential case in, in our world. Um, and in that scenario, we do absolutely advise a meeting with your association council uh, and the manager and the board to take a look at, you know, a suggested letter that would go out to the residents saying there's a potential case in the community. Right. And, and it's just a, ba a general letter and, um, you know, gives them some, some idea, you know, you can contact the health department, et cetera, et cetera. When it is a confirmed case, um, we also recommend another meeting with the association council and, and the, the board and the team to walk through that scenario because I guarantee you uh, as a board member, you're going to get people who demand to know, especially we're seeing more in our towers than in our HOAs, demand to know, you know, who it is, what floor they're on, et cetera, et cetera. You know, what are you gonna do to, um, you know, trace where all these people have been and who they've contacted? That's one of our other questions that came in, Jay, was um, the legal aspects of exposure tracking. And, um, you know, we've told our residents that is not something that your management company, were, you know, is trained to do. And that is something that the health departments are doing. So our experience has been when we've had a confirmed case, the health departments have been phenomenal and they are keeping in contact uh, with the person who is confirmed and they are making phone calls. They're doing those investigations. But Jay, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, here's the thing in Florida and most other states, but certainly here, when you undertake an obligation, you have the duty to do so reasonably. So what does that mean? You know, the, the old adage is someone's drowning, you go jump in the water after them and you end up pushing them down. Did you, did you cause something worse? Well, here it is, if you were gonna to try to undertake tracking and you have no knowledge of how to do so, you have no proficiency, no tools on how to do so, how could you undertake that duty reasonably? And the answer is you frankly can't. All we can do is disclose the appropriate information to get people to uh, prepare themselves, to take proper measures for themselves. And then, of course, I think, I think you do involve the Department of Health. I mean, they, they are the, the professionals here. We're just not. You know, I, I tell my managers all the time, you know, we have spring break problems up here. You know, it, 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 <laughs> yeah, that's not exclusive. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah uh, the, the SEC likes to come here during the months of March and April. And every year, you know, I have managers that call me and tell me about illegal activity that goes on and what should the boards be doing call the dang police that's what you should be doing they are law enforcement you are not someone throws a bottle off the 15th floor yeah did that break the rules of course it broke the rules it also broke the law and we need to get these people taken care of by the law in this situation it is the department of health is the best the best source we got and we need to be using that and we need to not pretend that we are the Department of Health. We community leaders are not the Department of Health. We need to take reasonable actions to give notice. But beyond that, I do not think it's an appropriate measure for uh, either managers or the board or any volunteers or committees of associations to say, well, I'm going to go back and track where this person's been. You're not qualified to do that. Yeah, and huge liability, right? And, and you know, I, I, and I appreciate all of the you know, in these circumstances, I always like to think glass half full and everyone has the best intentions. So the intention is, is great, right, to try to keep everybody safe. But um, unfortunately, it's just not something that you can take on locally. Um, we do have another question, Jay, that came in um, on this topic. So the question is from Laura, when having a telephone board of directors meeting uh, with the attorney, I think she's asking in this situation where it's, you know, a, there's a, a, let's say a confirmed COVID case, do we allow the owners to call in? Um, and I can tell you in the ones that we have done, they have been emergency, right? So we try, when we get a confirmed case, we're trying to get that information out as quickly as possible, like within hours of being notified. So do you want to comment on that? 
Yeah, so let, let's talk about the two different examples here. One, if you're wanting to talk to me about legal advice, uh, legal advice that could lead to possible litigation, I'm going to say no. That's that's already covered under the closed board meeting portions of uh, both acts. So I want to be able to give you frank and honest conversation without the uh, concern that the attorney-client privilege could be waived. So in the case of we need to discuss you know, a, a, a case, a COVID-19 case that has happened here, probably going to say, no, we're going to close that meeting to the ownership. But we may want to have a separate meeting after that that's open to the ownership. And I'm glad to participate in both. Uh, and in that case, we're going to have a message and it's going to be a unified message from the board and the management and association council as to what actions the association is going to take and what actions the association is not going to take. Uh, so let me, that's the, the COVID-19. Let me briefly discuss how, uh, how the owner participation should work if you're having a Zoom meeting or a conference call meeting that doesn't have to do with, with that. Like you just need to have a board meeting. Well, as we all know, unless it's for personnel reasons or for possible litigation reasons, you need to have your meetings open to the membership and they need to be able to participate. So how do we go about doing that in this world? Uh, you may have to do a little bit different than you have before. For instance, you may have to use the virtual features of uh, allowing questions like we have here that could be typed in the board can answer. Uh, you know, people always talk about the three minute rule. Uh, can owners speak for three minutes on each agenda item? I'd like for you to let them do that. Uh, but you may have to say, look, we're going to either put those at the very front or we're going to put those at the very back. Uh, and, and, and then we're going to we're going to take the board action. And here's uh, the key to all this. And, you know, generally why conference calls aren't great. You as the management uh, leaders and you as board leaders that are doing this, you need to try to figure out the technology on the front end. Like, for instance, there are ways in most cases like we have here where you can mute everybody and unmute the people that need to be talking. And then people could raise their hands in here. You could unmute their line. Uh, and the same thing true with, uh, with with a conference call. You mute everybody except for the board. The board does what the board needs to do. Then you go and unmute everybody else for the questions or, or the commentary section. So the structure may be a little different. You have to work with it. But I'd still like for the community leaders to allow the participation because, frankly, your membership wants to be heard. Now, maybe you're not going to act in the way that they want. Maybe they are misguided with their thoughts and observations, but that does not mean that their voice does not need to be heard by you. A lot of people just want their concerns out there and to know that their community leaders are listening and at least saying, you know, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jackson, I understand where you are coming from. We feel that we have to go X, but Certainly, I empathize and know why you feel why. So I think it's important to have that participation when you can. Great, great. That's a great explanation. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a couple. We've got maybe four or five questions that are somewhat similar, uh, Jay. So I'm going to try to summarize them. And it's all around um, association dues and the question of, you know, the pool is closed, the bocce ball courts are closed, the tennis courts are closed, the gym is closed. And so residents are saying, well, wait a minute, you know, all of these, all of these facilities are closed. I don't want to pay, you know, that portion of my maintenance fees. And um, they're asking about, you know, best practice and, and, you know, also from a legal standpoint, if you can speak to that, Jay, for a little bit, and then I can add some commentary as well. Yeah. So let's talk about, let me talk about the legal thing. You can't uh, not pay your assessments because you can't use the common elements. Like, Legally, there's a Supreme Court case on it that says you do minor not. Detail, minor detail, minor detail. Yeah, there, there is a Supreme Court case that says, sorry, you. it's an independent covenant. Owners, you have to pay your assessments. Uh, and assessments here, I mean your, main, your, your monthly dues. Your, your assessment's a legal term of art. It means special assessment, regular assessment. There's no difference between the two from a legal perspective. So that's the legal answer. Uh, let me tell you the other side of that. If the board said, look, we really want to give people a break. 
Uh, so we would like to say everybody can skip next month. Uh, on paying their monthly installment of dues. Do I recommend that? No, I don't recommend that because, the, pre <laughs> the, the, because the premium on your insurance is gonna stay the same, your management fee is gonna stay the same, your light bill is going to stay the same. So uh, do I recommend that? No. Do you have the legal ability if you treat everybody the exact same? Yes. Do you need to talk to your attorney before doing that and probably your CPA? Yeah, you probably do because you may have to dip into your reserves and generally boards, you don't get to do that for those reasons. Memberships have to play into that. So let's talk about the ancillary things. Let's talk about interest and late fees. Can you waive for a certain amount of time interest and late fees? Hey, owners, we get it. We get that, uh, uh, you know, it's hard right now. You don't have rental income coming in. Uh, you know, we'd like everybody to pay if you can. If you can't for 90 days for the next three months, we will not be doing interest and late fees. Sure. Do you have to treat everybody the same? Of course you do. You need to treat everybody the same in this regard. If you if you start to get special circumstances, you need to start having more in-depth conversations about those special circumstances because the general rule is we treat all owners the same. How are you seeing this done in Fiona, uh, down in Tampa, Fiona? Yeah, so really across the state, uh, we're getting the same questions as so it's very interesting. And our recommendation is, you know, just what you said, Jay, the association has to stay in business. And as tough as it may be, um, you know, you do not want to tell owners they don't have to pay their maintenance fees. That's a disaster. We all saw what happened in 2008. Uh, the board members have a fiduciary responsibility to, you know, run the association. Um, and so what we, what we have done, for example, at Castle is we are monitoring for example, we just had obviously, you know, April comes. So some of our associations are quarterly, some of them are monthly. Uh, we monitored where the association was, you know, last year in April on, you know, April 20th, where were they as far as delinquency versus this year? And we have not seen any change yet. Now that is because we continued right. to send, you know, the late letters. And what we did do uh, in the late letter is um, add a page that, you know, addressed the issue with the residents and said, you know, we understand, you know, some of you may have been negatively affected and here are some of the programs that are available, right? And some resources that are available to you, um, you know, in the state of Florida to get assistance. Uh, I like but that. The, yeah, but the association needs to, to keep going. And so we're monitoring it very closely. Um, we're chatting with boards one-on-one -on -one and with treasurers. We're looking at the overall financial position um, and, you know, dealing with those uh, individual cases one-on-one, -on -one, just as you would have done, you know, in the past, at, you know, if someone came to you and said, hey, I need a payment plan. Um, we had a question come in, and it's from Ann. She says, our association dues are paid quarterly. Does the board have the flexibility to allow owners to pay monthly to help spread that out? Um, comments on that, Jay? Yeah, I mean, generally that would be a, a document specific matter. So what I would tell Ian is go look at the bylaws. And when I say the bylaws, I really mean the bylaws. I don't mean the Declaration of Condominium. I don't mean the Articles of Incorporation. I mean, look at the bylaws and see what flexibility uh, the board has. My guess is that it gives the board the flexibility to do that. Uh, you know, I, I would be curious from your perspective, from the management perspective, I know many of you guys use lock boxes and those kind of things at, uh, at, at the at the banks. Beyond the legal side, which you know probably not an issue, is there a practical problem where if you're set up quarterly, if people split that up and started paying monthly? Yeah, so, so traditionally or generally what will happen is if it's due quarterly, the system recognizes that it is due quarterly. So if you only pay a portion of it, you're gonna get, it's gonna show up on your AR and the association's AR report as being you know, late. So if the, if the association fee is, let's say, you know, $500 for the quarter and the person sent in a check for 175, it's gonna show the balance as being late. Um, the lockbox will still accept it. You can always send payments to the lockbox. That's not an issue. Um, so I think those things are, are to your point, are, are very community specific and they, they have to work that out for each community. Uh, um, the other thing for, for boards to consider, you know, you mentioned the expenses aren't going away. You still have your electricity, et cetera. 
uh, especially in our tower communities, some of the expenses are going up because everybody's home. So for example, you put all that trash down the trash chute. Typically, if you have, you know, 300, uh, a 300 unit residence condo, you got 600 people there and now everybody's home all day, every day. Well, that's increasing the amount of trash that's going sure. down the trash chute. Guess what? You need to pull that, you know, the, uh, the trash bins more uh, frequently. Water usage is going up. And gosh forbid, if you do have uh, a confirmed case, you need to do very specific oh, yeah. um, decontamination and that's expensive. So not only are, you know, some of the expenses perhaps that a resident could say going down, but yeah, they're also going up, right? So again, it speaks to, um, in, in fairness of being in the residence seat, they don't necessarily know all of that. And so right. getting back to communication and letting residents know this, is what's going on this is you know the why behind what we're doing is is very important um i think we'll jump away from maintenance fees jay unless you had anything else that you wanted to cover from the maintenance fee standpoint okay we've got quite a few questions regarding uh vacation rentals i know we've got a lot of people on the line who have vacation rentals we see that all over the state right where um they've got short-term rentals uh they're a a um an investor and they own a unit and literally they can't rent it right now. So um, the, one of the questions is, when do you think it would be a reasonable time to have vacation rentals reopen? What liability does an association have if vacation renters come in earlier than when the actual association is back open for business? Yeah, so uh, great question. Kind of goes back to the same analysis for what we have in the pool open. And by the way, the more amenities you have open in your community, the more attractive you are to uh, people that want to come there. Uh, right now in Florida, you can't do vacation rentals at condominiums. There's an executive order. Uh, I think it is 2020-87 that you can go look up and it was extended through April 30th by 2020, executive order 2020-103. So through April, at least, you condominium associations and HOAs, you can't do short-term rentals. So really we're talking about what happens after that point and when you have some discretion on your boards. Again, lawyer, not epidemiologist, no idea uh, whether you should or should not do this from a scientific or medical standpoint. What liability do you have? Again, it's the same thing as the pool liability. Uh, are you taking reasonable measures given all the circumstances to protect the safety, health, and welfare of the community? I mean, that's really the standard that we're going to be going with. Uh, and it's going to be a community standard. So, for instance, in our area, uh, we don't have thank God, a, a large outbreak right now, uh, as some areas in Florida have. But if we started to get influx from New Orleans, Atlanta, places that have had a large outbreak, and which, by the way, traditionally do visit us during these times, uh, could that spread more? Sure. Uh, so I don't know the answer of when you should allow. I, I, I would question anybody that tells you that they do know that answer. Uh, if they're not the Department of Health, they're not the CDC, they're not those groups, uh, you know, your friend on Facebook that uh, thinks that they know everything uh, probably doesn't. So I'd be careful about that kind of stuff. But the reality of the situation is everybody wants to get back to uh, a norm normal operations here. And especially in our area, that's going to be rentals. And I expect rentals to open as soon as they are legally allowed to. I mean, that's just the reality of where we are here. Uh, I would advise my boards that if you do not uh, take rental prohibition or uh, some kind of restriction of that, if you're not going to do that, then you need to go to the other side. You need to go to the upping the disinfectant. You need to go to, uh, you know, making sure that you're trying to keep the social distancing at common amenities to the extent possible, uh, at least taking the uh, perfunctory steps of the posting of the notices and keeping track of the measures that you are taking. Again, all of this is trying to just create a buffer against future liability related to the issue. Yeah, and Jay, I can tell you, so we, we obviously went through the, um, you know, the quarantine from different, different states have different rules and people traveling to Florida. So when they did the stay at home orders, um, 
up north. I won't mention any states in particular. I don't want to offend. Uh, but we had a lot of people travel down quickly. We saw a huge influx of people. And so there was a lot of concern from our communities, again, especially um, in the, you know, the closer, um, you know, condos, you know, what do we do? And so when you can control from your association who's coming in and coming out and what do i mean by that you know if there are key fobs re you know required things like that that you can sort of monitor who's coming in if it's a gated community it's easier to do that um, we had you know flyers done up if you're from this state here is the you know the notice that you should quarantine you know use all of the resources that you have available to you um, to educate everybody and set the expectation um, so that we are, you know, trying to keep everybody safe. Again, communicate, 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 and educate. Those are the, I can't stress that enough, super important. Um, and as we start to reopen uh, amenities, whenever that may be, um, we're going to have to put together a playbook, which Castle was working on right now. What does it look like reopening, you know, amenities in an HOA versus a condo? What rules should there be? What signage should there be? you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we're working on that now. And, and again, everyone's welcome to reach out at info at castlegroup.com. We'd be happy to um, supply that once it's available. Uh, let's see, other questions that we had come in. I wanna try to make sure we get to everybody's questions. Um, we had a lot of questions regarding um, what changes to the landscape of vacation rentals do I need to be anticipating as a vacation rental owner? And I think we've kind of, Touched yeah, I, I mean, look, do I, again, lawyer, not real estate uh, uh, or economic specialist uh, in these things, do I think this is going to be a tough year for the rental market, a tough year for the rental market? I think it's going to be tough. I think that people are going to be scared. Uh, I think that we have somewhat of an advantage in that we get a lot of regional travel, uh, so people are driving here as opposed to flying here. I think flying is going to be kind of the last thing that people want to do, and especially uh, going through Hartsfield and, and airports like that that are worldwide hubs. Uh, so, you know, take heart in that I think that you will have people that may have their family vacations where they were going to fly to uh, Disney, and they've decided instead of flying to Disney, they're going to load up the, the car and they're going to drive to Destin or Panama City or, uh, or, or uh, Pensacola Beach. I think that you will get some of that, but if you think that it's going to be anything like it was last year, I mean, I just think you're sadly mistaken. I, I, I think that we will see uh, some pretty good sized downtick in, in the market for this year in rentals. Yeah, okay. And then we had two similar questions, Jay, that came in. Um, they're talking about short term rentals. And essentially, the question is, you know, during this ban, what can the association do if they realize they've got someone still doing the short term rentals when they're not supposed to be? Yeah, so a uh, couple things. One is the executive order, uh, it makes it clear that violation of the executive order. Uh, the, the original emergency order and then these follow-ups can result in criminal penalties. Uh, six months in jail, $500, you can get that. Do I think that's going to actually happen? No. But what do I think will happen is the governor has directed uh, the, uh, the Department of uh, Hotels and Restaurants and Lodging to revoke all licenses for anybody that uh, violates the order. So if you have people that are violating the order, you know, you could just tell the, the uh, applicable governmental agency, in this case, it would be the Department of Hotel and Lodging, that this is happening and they can take whatever measures they are going to take. What can you take as an association leader internally? Well, if you pass a rule that says we are going to abide by the executive order, which makes sense to me. Now you have a private restriction with contractual rights being able to enforce it. 
I, you know, you can go as far as suing the owner for not doing it. Of course, there's the fines and suspensions that we've all talked about for rule breaking in general. But uh, certainly, I, I think it would start with what I would call a love letter for me that would say, uh, hey, owner, you're now on my radar. We saw this on VRBO. Uh, we are, I am going to start taking action now unless you immediately take it down. Don't worry about fines and suspensions. You're going to be dealing with my office and you're also going to be dealing with the applicable governmental officials. And then hopefully that's enough to cause reason to set in. But yes, you have legal remedies. We have some associations uh, down in the southeast corner of the, the state that are already in court filing emergency injunctions against owners that are violating uh, the restrictions that have been set in from the board. So do you have a, a day in court and a legal remedy? Yes, you do. Uh, it can be very expensive for owners that want to violate those things. Right. And then we had another question come in live from David. He says Airbnb does not require a license, does it? And, uh, and I think on that one, it doesn't really matter. I'm not sure exactly if from David's question, but from what you're saying, it doesn't matter if it requires a license or not. The executive order is the executive order. So yeah, I, I, I don't, frankly, I don't care. I don't know if it does. I, I can tell you that if, if your association has passed a rule that says we are abiding by that order and nobody in our uh, our community shall do short-term rentals during this time uh, and someone uh, violates that, uh, we have a legal remedy in court with or without that executive order. Right, okay. And last question, because we're just about out of time. Um, can the association direct unit owners to rent only to guests from areas of the United States not known as hotspots? Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, so so here's, here's a couple problems with it. First, the dirty legal answer. There's something called the Privileges and Immunities Clause where you're not supposed to be able to treat people differently. Is a that gets to whether a community association is a state actor. That gets to a whole bunch of case law that we don't have time to go into, and a half of you'd fall asleep if I talk about it. <laughs> so there's that issue. But look, don't I, I I just don't recommend going that far. Who are you to determine what a hotspot is and what's not? I mean, right now we have two executive orders that say New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Louisiana. Does that mean that Chicago is not a hot spot? Does that mean that Los Angeles is not a hot spot? And if you were going to say, well, Chicago, which it has, has had a huge infl or a huge increase in, in, uh, in cases, does that mean that you are qualified board member to make the determination that the Department of Health for the state of Florida and the governor has not made? I mean, this just, it leads you down a slippery path. And what I see that leading to is lawsuits from owners suing associations saying you substituted your judgment for the judgment of health officials in making determinations that injured my pocketbook. Let's yeah. not go. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that speaks to the, you know, the experience we've had already with trying to uh, follow the guidelines, educate anyone who is coming in if there's quarantine guidelines, you know, in place for those people, uh, which the state of Florida implemented for anyone coming in from out of state from certain states. So those tools we have to use uh, as an association. So we are um, just about out of time. I want to take a minute. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And that was some great discussion. Jay, you did a phenomenal job. We appreciate Thank your time you. this morning. Um, our info is up on the screen. And I'll leave you for any closing comments, Jay. I just want to thank you, Fiona, so much, and, and Gian and the whole crew at Castle Group for having me. It's been a pleasure talking with you this morning. Community leaders out there, you know, this is a tough time. Don't think that we don't recognize that this is a tough time, but you have people you can rely on. You can rely on people that are dedicating their lives on this side of advising you. Uh, we will give you our best thoughts. We can't promise anything in this time, but we can promise you that you will get our best efforts and best thoughts. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe out there. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.